a school lunch. Now I spit a 16 straight with no punch. Hey everyone, how's it going? This is Norm Schriever, real estate and mortgage marketing with Norm Podcast. Hope everyone's doing really well and staying busy. I wanted to bring to you today a, a fun guest, someone who's became a really good friend of mine, John Coleman. He's a mortgage broker extraordinaire in Dublin, Ireland. So we had a really fun conversation today. He was telling me how things work in Ireland in terms of the real estate and mortgage industry, way different than in the U.S., and a lot of other good fun facts about the market, home ownership, buying, and of course, supplying mortgages to people in Ireland. So without further ado, here we have Sir John Coleman. Thanks so much for listening. Perfect. Today we have on the podcast an awesome special guest, uh, a man I've been hunting down trying to get on the podcast for a while because he's a superstar in his own right, John Coleman out of Dublin, Ireland. John, how are you today? How are you, Norm? That's a great introduction there. You've been called a superstar. I I, I don't know how to follow that, but yeah, it's lovely lovely to talk to you again. Yeah, you too, you too. So tell us a little bit of who you are and what you do and where you're at. Well, um, I suppose for my sins, I've been a mortgage broker for over 16 years here in, in, in Dublin, Ireland. And uh, God, I've seen all sorts of things, the, the financial crisis, where we're currently at right now, the good times when banks were throwing money at people. So, yeah, I have a very strong background in, in, um, in mortgages and helping people get their homes here in Dublin, Ireland, or in Ireland in general. Great, great. And are you from Dublin originally? Yeah, I've lived all my life. I spent a summer in London when I was in 19 and uh, came back and for summer, I've never, ever moved out of Ireland. It's a great place to live. I mm. really um, wouldn't want to live anywhere else. No, no offense. Yeah, <laughs> none taken, <laughs> none taken, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I couldn't be happier living here in Ireland. And I think a lot of people are going to want to move to Ireland uh, when the dust settles. And we'll talk about that more too, you know. But um, for people who don't know... Uh, just, uh, Dublin is the main city, correct? It is indeed. There's kind of four major cities here in, in, in Ireland. Now, there's, Ireland is broken up into there's no, Ireland and there's Northern Ireland. And I won't get too political here, but Northern Ireland belongs to um, Great Britain. Um, Ireland, the, the 26 counties, as we call it, would be the four major cities. There will be Dublin, which is the capital. Cork, Galway and Limerick would be the four kind of cities here in, in Ireland. Um, and then there's obviously lots of places around Dublin mm. and like around Cork and around Goy that are um, very nice places to live in as well. But where I am from is from the, it's the capital is Dublin, Ireland. Yeah. And how big is Dublin? Like how many people? Just curious. Ooh, yeah, about over a million, maybe a million and a quarter. It depends on the last um, census. And I'm trying to remember now. It's been a while since I, I saw that. It, it's definitely over about, um, I think, 1.2 million, I think, is your base um, number of people that are living here in Dublin. That's I think pretty, it's about five, over five and a half in Ireland in total. That's pretty damn small. That's insanely small. <laughs> I won't take insult to that, Robert. <laughs> no, no, that's a good thing these days. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it doesn't feel small, but um, when you put it, in, when you look at it versus other countries and other cities, it, it is small, but yeah. it, it certainly is a great place. No, that's a live, good thing so. these days, believe me, and so today what we're going to talk a lot about on the podcast here is, of course, you're a mortgage lender there in Dublin, Ireland, and we're going to talk about the differences between real estate, mortgage, buying a home, selling a home uh, between Ireland and maybe the U.S. or Canada. And you've had, you've had uh, plenty of people who are actually moving to Ireland uh, from abroad, from the U.S., Canada, and other countries who you have helped. So you... You get to talk to people and you see the shock on their face or the confusion on their face. Um, so we're going to highlight a, a couple of those differences. Um, first off, who is it that you actually are helping over there with home loans a lot? In the main, it would be your first time buyer. So someone who's um, literally, whether they're from Ireland or from outside of Ireland, whether they're coming to, they're living here and they want to buy, basically instead of renting, they want to buy their home. So that would be the, probably 80% of my business will be first-time buyers. Mm. Um, you know, then made of people who are looking to invest in properties. You may be looking to refinance. But in the main, it would be literally first-time buyers, people who are li- looking to um, buy their, their home mm. here and in, is it, um, or in Ireland. I know in the U.S., it's sort of like the American dream, quote-unquote, is to buy a house and that, you know, there's 
all the statistics show that if home ownership is the easiest portal or the simplest portal to wealth, to building wealth, um, and having a higher net worth, a better quality of life, better educated kids who have a better quality of life. So it's home ownership has really been the standard of uh, of if you're doing well. And we have right now about sixty four percent home ownership rates. What what is it like in Ireland, and what are your yeah, home ownership rates? Really good point. Home ownership here in Ireland is very aspirational as well, given our history. Um, with the with the British owning your own home is a very very aspirational very very powerful feeling within the Irish um, race. Hmm. We're even higher than that, by the way. We're we're close to seventy percent home ownership. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, it has been higher and it's been lower, but you're kind of looking at an average of about seventy percent um, based on the, the last census. Again, like it's it, it's it is in every Irish family that the sort of Get, so that the goal is or the ambition is to help their the next of kin get their home. It, mm. it, it, generations is it, kind of the way it's been yeah. going. Um, and people just want to have their own home. That's great. 70% is really high. The U.S. at the, the highest point before the 2008 crash was at like 69%. And that's when they were giving loans to people who should not have had them. I mean, that was 100% financing and you didn't need to verify any income and you, you know, no doc loans and stated. Yeah, it. we had versions of, we had our own version of that happening as yeah. well. Like where there were certainly loans were being given out to people on a self-declaration from an accountant saying, yes, this guy can afford to repay the loan. So oh. we had our own version of um, crazy lending going on back in the day um as well so but yeah it's still a very high percentage of people yeah um own their own home and the demand even in the current um set of circumstances with the covid going on is still really really strong i haven't had any letdown and people want to talk to me around buying their own home which surprised me slightly um but obviously i was pleased um i did think there might be a slight fall off but no People are still want to, will still want to buy their own home, whether it be six months, nine months down the road. Yeah, yeah. they, the, they the, might um, have aspirations to. Certainly, won't be changing. In fact, it will probably given yeah. people are stuck in in places, are stuck at home, and they're and they, they, the demand or desire to own your own home will probably only increase. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like I I said to people, the whole concept of home is more valuable and important than ever now, right? But it's also, I think, you know. A lot of over here, at least in the U.S., a lot of younger people, millennials or just, you know, 20s, 30s, they have a real hard time getting a home now just because it's it's expensive. Unfortunately, renting's expensive and, you know, uh, buying a home, the prices have gone up for the last decade. So it's still, you know, the best option for you. But trying to get your foot in the door and actually get your keys and owning your first home, a, a lot of young yeah. people have trouble. Very, very similar experience here, Norm. Um, and there was an election just recently um, where housing, before obviously the outbreak of coronavirus, where housing actually was pretty much the de determination of the actual results. We mm. didn't end up with a government on the back of it, but housing was the number one issue that, um, and lack of housing for people that was was basically came through loud and clear. Um, so the next government who's about to form very soon will be, um, this will be their number one priority, will be to try to help people, more people get, get their own homes here. Mm. Um, they obviously have to solve or deal with the, the, the current situation first. Yeah. But as soon as that's taken care of, bang, we're all back to business. Yeah. Housing is going to be the number one thing that will be on the government's agenda here. Yeah, and I think, you know, of course, the economy is getting hit just in wave after wave. It's like a heavyweight fight, and it's taken a punch to the stomach, a punch to the head, a hook to the, you know, it's like one after another, you know. But, That's a great description. Yeah, yeah, and it's like just a flurry, and you're just like, all right, when can we catch our breath and, you know, and start playing defense at least. But, you know, with that being said, I think the housing market was very strong going into into this crash and it wasn't propped up by a bunch of bullshit like it was during before the 2008 crash with these you know no doc loans stated income negative amortization loans and everyone buying houses just to treat them like ATM machines it was 10 years of equity it accrued so there's a lot of equity and rates are low so the point of this is I don't think there'll be a huge wave of foreclosures and people trying to sell their house for 
pennies on the dollar here. What we're seeing is volume is way down, but the prices have only dipped, you know, moderately. Yeah, but for here in Ireland, I'd have a very similar um, view to yourself. Um, currently, the impact is going to be more on um, activity. So a house has been bought and sold. That Those numbers are down purely because, well, no one can go in and see a house currently. But that, assuming that in the next month or two that that, that changes and we're back and um, working in some form of new more normality, as you'd call it, um, I would see a slight, this may, my own personal view now, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but my own personal view, there will be a slight market adjustment for sure because it's been a big economic impact. But the baseline of demand is mm. still, here in Ireland, really, really strong. Yeah. And while it, a lot of people, there will be a certain number of people who will be impacted, um, unfortunately, would, may have lost a job, there's still going to be a, a higher portion of people who are still um, going to be working. So I would see the demand still being there, though people will be more cautious and maybe maybe adopt a sort of a wait and see process. But there could also be then great opportunities for people whereby suddenly a, proud, a house that they may not have been able to get at this moment may in the next three to six months become available for them. So there'll be people looking to be opportunistic and then there'll be other people who will be looking to take a wait and see approach. But at some point, the wait and see approach will come. It'll be very much, yeah. we've got to get our own home. We've got to move yeah. on with our life. Um, we're sick of waiting, basically. So I don't see the demand going anywhere on a sort of a, sh a short term basis or on a sort of a medium term basis short term it might take a bit of a hit all right yeah. but yeah. um i don't see it i see it rebounding pretty quickly that's my own view obviously i can't no i <laughs> think you're right i think you're right exactly you know i think it's not that our you know everything is devalued i think it's broken so it's sort of like a conveyor belt and, you know, all the the goods are still on it and there's still supply and demand, but the conveyor belt's broken. And so things are not getting through in terms of, you know, mortgage yeah, lending. That's a brilliant, yeah, yeah, that's you know, a brilliant description. Yeah. And so <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to rob your words more because they're, that's a much better way of putting it than I would. I just thought that's really, really, that is a really apt analogy there. And and the words will sound a lot better coming out of your mouth with your accent too, believe me, you know. <laughs> Okay, well. but but so I think uh, I, I definitely think that as things start getting fixed, or we have the new normal, or as you know, there's some the markets find their equilibrium, the conveyor belt will start moving again, and like you said, the demand is there. Here here's the problem with people who are waiting, right? Always I'm waiting for the interest rates to go down. No, I'm waiting for the prices to go down. No, I'm waiting for the perfect time. If you if you wait, you're late because. We very well could see where prices are at, you know, 10, 15, 20 year lows, interest rates are at all time lows, but the requirements to actually get that loan and get that home may be more stringent than ever. So for instance, in the US now, a lot of lenders, uh, a lot of banks are saying you need a 700 credit score and 20% down or a lot of these low down payment programs are going away. So, you know, 700 credit score, it's like less than, ha or I think half the country probably has that. Um, but then with down, you know, so maybe the rates are great and the prices are low, but if you can't access them, then it does you absolutely no good. Yeah, what they could potentially do here, which they had done in the last, the last crash, was, was increased, as you write, to the 20% down. Currently, it stands at... 90, 10% down. So the advice that I'm actually giving people currently now is is get yourself approved while we're still working on um, criteria that are more favorable. That approval will last for six months and, and then be able oh. to see if there's an opportunity that comes your way because you rightly point out in a very short period of time, banks may take a different kind of more hardline view on, on their credit policies and may make it more difficult for people to be approved. So... Um, that is the advice I'm actually currently giving to oh, people. Oh, that's interesting. So, in so they could get uh, approved with you now, and then that that lasts for six months, and so they're they're almost sort of grandfathering in their uh, approval, huh? Yeah, it's a, it's certainly, um, and obviously at the same time, they still need to find a home that it, that ticks all the boxes. But at least they're giving themselves the opportunity, whereby if the banks within the next two to three months take a um, take a sort of a hard look at who they're going to lend to, and sort of say, oh, we we'll only lend to people who have twenty percent suddenly that changes the whole um, range of opportunities that would be open to people. So 
it does make a lot of sense. I don't know. The system here is a little bit different, but I know the approvals here that last would last for six months. Yeah. So it gives people a sort of an opportunity to. Yeah, it um, gives them a window to, to find a home. They don't need to have moved into a house within six months. They just need to have found a house yeah. within six months. So that gives a window even. even well, yeah, a I think of time. I think the point is people are going to have to work a little harder to earn it. Like for here with the higher credit standards, you know, even if you can get approved with a six twenty credit score. You know, if, if you take a couple months to invest in credit repair and, and fix up your credit a little and get above 700, you're going to see way better deals and way better pricing. And so what what kind of credit score standards or what's the whole credit so- score system over there? Totally different to um, so we have a system whereby it's basically it's almost one strike and you're out. If you had loans in the past or um, a mortgage in the past or any kind of form of credit um, where you've taken a car loan, an education loan, personal loan, and you have missed payments on it, they will turn it down straight off the bat. So it's not a case of a credit score. It's literally, have you got a perfect credit rating? Whoa. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's very severe. Um, and sometimes it can take five years for your actual credit rating to be fully repaired. In some instances, does it just, they run two credit reports. One of these reports goes back 10 years, um, and the sins of the past can come back to um, come back to haunt you. Um, Whoa, that so is, is pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's really, really severe. It's the first piece of advice I give every customer um, is get your credit checked. Uh, it's not a credit rating score as you, as you have over there, but it's get your credit checked, make sure that there's, no, there's absolutely no issues. Um, now, for... Anyone that was potentially moving from um, the US or Canada over to mm. Ireland, they wouldn't look for a credit check of sort, but they would look for there's a, a, a credit report via um, Experian. Now, they wouldn't be looking, they'd be looking to see loans that you had, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have any loans? Really, that's their first port of call. Do you have any loans back home? Because they don't want to be lending to people, or at least not, they'd want to factor in any loans that you might currently have back in the US, hmm. but if they did take a look at a credit report from the US and there was a whole number of missed payments on it, hmm. they, w- they could use that as an excuse to say no. Wow. So it is quite, it's very tight. That's interesting, and you guys are doing it right because in the US, the American way is to uh, run up a bunch of debt and then uh, default on it and then rebuild and be ready for the next round. I mean, that's what corporations do you know, with these bailouts. That's what the government is doing. That's what consumers do. There's people that went through the financial crash and you'd be, you'd be shocked. They ran up $70,000 worth of credit card debt and loans. They had a massive house they couldn't afford. And they modified the payments or they foreclosed, but they didn't make their payment for 18 months, 12 months, and they lived there. Auto loans, like everything. And then they just went bankrupt or they just, you know, let go of all this stuff. And in maybe two, three, four years, uh, everything was rebuilt and the banks were lending them money and they were buying a home or cars again. It, it's like a revolving door. Yeah. yeah. There's probably a reason, and I'll explain, there's a reason why that might be the case. Well, here in Ireland, it's much more difficult for a bank to get the home back off the individual because of our, there's a, as I said, the society wants to own our own homes. It's, it's viewed as like you banks could be waiting up to five years wow. before they get their home. They get the keys back of someone for defaulting on a, on a loan. Right. So um, from, so from the bank's point of view, they have to be really, really severe about who they're going to lend to the profile of the, of the customer making sure they've demonstrated no credit issues is really, really important. For that reason, it could take the banks years to get the, the person out of the house once wow. they've taken, taken ownership of it. You know? Are there a, It's a little bit off script, but are there a lot of scams out there, meaning like people who try to you know, put up, they call them straw buyers, like fake buyers or different groups or organized crime or anyone that's sort of trying to, trying to hustle the system? Not that I've heard of. Um, maybe I'm living. I'm a naive. Um, or yeah, no, that's not something I've come ac- come across. I've I've heard of scams with renting markets and people who are, who are trying to rent houses that aren't don't even exist or don't belong to the person. I have heard those type of scams from from the rental in the rental market. But um, 
buying a house, it would be, I can't see how it would, how it would work with the system that's here, you know? Interesting. Well, you guys are doing something right because the, the scams also are just insane in the U.S. here. So let's talk about, um, we, talk, uh, we talked a little about how you have some people coming from U.S. or Canada. Maybe they're coming to Ireland for work. Maybe they're of Irish descent or their family was or it's a, a retirement home. There's two, Norm, there's two reasons that people come over here, right? Um, to live. One is job opportunities, and there's some significant job opportunities. Or two is the love of an Irish woman or an Irish girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they be the, uh, the reasons. And joking aside, the, the job opportunities will be the main one, obviously, because there's significant um, big American companies, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Google have all got significant presences here mm. in Ireland. So there's some really, really good job opportunities for people. So it's the country and the people and what we have to offer not being that big as you mentioned earlier on is a very um big draw to this country for people to come and live here with the the education his system here is really really strong and the countryside people are very friendly so Mm. it's got a lot going for it the one thing it doesn't have going for it the weather Mm. (laughs) but that's something that that's outside our control why is it is it too hot and sunny all the time huh you don't you don't (laughs) get enough rain (laughs) that might be um (laughs) we'll we'll just go that far it's um mixed weather it's listen it's a beautiful place to live if we had um 70 degrees or 22 i think you'd call it um fahrenheit 22 or 23 degrees every day then it would be perfect yeah we, we can't have that you know you guys get a ton of rain huh we do get a fair bit, yeah, um, but that would be, so I wouldn't want to kid anyone who's thinking of coming over that the, the weather is perfect, it's not. Yeah, well, some people don't mind that, like it's uh, the Se- the Pacific Northwest, like Seattle, Portland, you know, Washington, stuff like that, Oregon, um, those areas get a, a lot of rain and they're, they're absolutely gorgeous, so um, yeah, interesting. So I know that um, when we talk about people going back and forth, or people moving to Ireland, let's say from the U.S. or Canada, listeners may may think that's just ah, you know, one or two a year. That's hardly any, but a drop in the bucket. But most people don't realize that 10.1 percent of the U.S. population claims Irish ancestry as of the 2017 census. So 10 percent of the U.S. is Irish ancestry. So that's um, a lot of people moving moving over to Ireland or have parents that came over or going back and forth. Um, yeah, it's certainly, um, there's someone, every, any American you'd ever meet does seem to be able to say, yeah, my friend's mother, <laughs> yeah. there's always some time somewhere along the way, uh, to Ireland. It's, it's, it's incredible, um, to, uh, just to listen to the mental people who claim, who claim Irish accent. Yeah. I don't know if it's all 100% legitimate, but. I'm sure who might. Well, we joke them. around here that, uh, on, you know, most days, uh, of the year, it's ten percent of the population is Irish, and then on St. Patrick's then, Day, it's Patrick's like eighty-five percent. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But but I did read also that there's more than half a million non-Irish nationals living in Ireland. So basically, foreigners in in a country of what you said six million population. Not even six. That's, yeah, that's so a it's, lot. Ten percent. Ten percent of the population would be yeah. non-national, but and would be. Um, not non-Irish is yeah. the best way to it, you know. So when someone moves over there, let's say you have someone from the U.S. who, who calls you or emails and, and is looking about to uh, buy a house and you know get a loan and inquire, when they start the process, um, what are they usually most surprised or confused about? Well, there's a few things. First thing, not all banks will lend to them, right? Based on their this is and this is one thing that would shock them a little bit. Based on their their status, right? Mm. Um, some of the banks will be very um, particular about who they'd lend to based on, well, their view would be if, if someone came over here, there was a property crash, they could just hand the keys back and, and vanish out back back home so that the bank would, would be left with a property that was worth less than they'd lent on it. So mm. that would be the first thing. So that not all banks will lend to them, but mm. um, there are banks that will, um, and it's based on they're having the right work status in terms okay. of their actual um their visa that would be the most important thing um for them so they might get when they start talking to gold banks and they say no we kind of go, oh are we not going to be able to buy a home here and then someone might put them my way and then i can say well actually 
don't worry, you will be able to buy a home. You just won't have the choice of the whole market to yeah. lend to. You'll just have to work with the lenders who would be prepared to lend to you. And that's your job and what you do a good job at is searching between different banks and lenders and institutions to find them the best deal or find them the right fit, right? Absolutely. There's two pro like in, there's two parts of the process. One is to get a, to make sure that they have the money secured, right? Which is part one. Then their job is to go and find a home that they're happy um, to see themselves living in. Then part two is then to make sure that it's still the best deal in the marketplace that's available to them. So there's a, there's a kind of a three stages. One, to make sure you can get the money. There's two, find a home. And then there's three, reconfirm that you still have the best deal out there. Because buying a home isn't something that happens overnight. You might get approval today. You might take four months to find a house. And then it might take another three months to close. So there's a lot, wow. a lot of things can change in the, in the meantime. Yeah. And my role is to... I suppose it is to manage the process. One, make sure you can buy a house, and then two, make sure you're getting the best deal at the back end. And it takes that long? It could take up to three months to close the yeah, close this the is deal? Yeah, this is one of the things that shocks um, the Americans and the Canadians the most, right? It's the speed. It, um, things apparently happen in the U.S. a lot quicker um, than happen over here. That like it's a, it's a very long process. Um, the thing that shocks them the most, Norm, would be there's no system of a, of a realtor system as such whereby someone goes and finds you a home, right? Hmm. That just doesn't exist here in Ireland. Huh. It's ba- Yeah, no, it's, it's the thing that shocks the most it's because, in effect, the realtor only works for the, the person selling the house. So the people get treated as it, they're not they're not the client. Yeah. The client doesn't belong. The client is the person who's selling the house from the realtor. So you're, the, the person buying the home is almost just a... I wouldn't say a piece of meat, but it's, 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 it's very, um, it's a transaction. There's no relationship yeah. involved with the person. Yeah. So it, it can become much more difficult in terms of how to bid on a property, how to secure a property, especially if it's secondhand. I obviously do like to bring added value to this process whereby I will give advice to my clients on how to, to bid or how to go about that process without ever gambling with their money because ultimately it's a, it's a home that they have to pay yeah. and they have to mortgage they have to take but that particular uh, part of the process really surprises people oh i don't have someone that can go and find me a home no you basically have to do that search yourself and then go and visit all the different um houses that are, are for sale with different agents right and that's the bit that they don't get their head around and say oh it's not the same person who's bringing me no you're you could be dealing with five or six different if you're looking at five or six different houses you're potentially looking, talking to five or six different agents who are only seeing you as one person. Yeah. But ultimately, the person who pays them is the person who's selling the house. So well, it's a completely different dynamic to the process. Yeah, that's crazy. And then with the buyer, forget finding the house is hard enough, right? But when it comes to negotiating the terms, the contracts, the I mean, they're just left it's, by themselves. It's, it, 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 that's crazy. Yeah, it's very scary for anyone, whether it's someone coming into this country or someone in this country, but bidding on a house is a daunting process. It's something you do once, maybe twice in your life. But as a first-time buyer, you've never done it before. So, and then you're dealing with an agent who you don't know. You don't know if he's feeding you the correct information. Um, so it is it, it is a daunting process and one that's, um, I'm sure there's an opportunity for someone to come in and change, yeah. <laughs> shake things up a little bit here. That's the first um, thing I thought about. Me and you should open up... Uh, <laughs> You know, John and Norm, real estate agency, you know. <laughs> we could then uh, promote ourselves into the American community here. I'd say we'd get a fair bit of business going yeah. in truth because it's – and it wouldn't just be from the Americans, Canadians. There would be a, there'd be a lot of – there certainly would be a demand for that. Um, I just don't know. Um, I'm, my area of expertise is – Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I don't want to pretend I'm an, an expert in each individual house. So I certainly will – help people yeah. with regard to how they should handle the bidding process. Yeah. That is, there's an art to that. You know, wow. Sure. So, so your role is even more, I mean, you're, even though it's not official, your role is really working with these people for, you know, six, eight months, a year from start to finish in a lot of different capacities. So you really are working hard for your clients. Yeah, well, that's what I enjoyed that at the, at the very end or when they get the, they get the keys and ultimately, if they feel like, in effect, I've taken the role of a little bit of the of the realtor for these people, whereby I've been the person who's been there to answer a lot of their questions. Because another thing they find very difficult here, 
Um, the law, the, the, our, soli our solicitors, are, I think, the, I don't know what you might call them, the, uh, the lawyers over there, again, they have a totally different way of doing business with people than people might be expected. To, um, their customer service is um, ordinary, shall we say, yeah. the best way to describe <laughs> it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, they don't believe in communicating with people unless there's some information you could go two weeks without hearing from your um from your lawyer we, we call them solicitors by the way okay and it's a very frustrating part of the process you're doing the biggest thing in your life and you, you're getting no information back even not getting any information to say i have no information yeah uh, so but the joy at the very end when they do get their keys and they feel that you've been a significant part of the process yeah it's very rewarding um, but it is a journey, uh, and, but yeah. it's, it, and it has frustrations along the way because you're still dealing with banks and you're sometimes dealing with their red tape that's probably unnecessary some of the time, but they make the rules, so you have to play their game, you know, and that, my job is to, to manage the whole thing. Wow, yeah, so that's, your role is about, you know, 10 times bigger than what it is for the average lender in the U.S., I think. Our transactions... You know, in the U.S., speed is everything, right? We're impatient. We're we have our customer service is too good for the most part, and we're very spoiled with a lot of things. So it's uh, you know a lot of home transactions. Once they find a home and they they put in an offer that gets accepted, they might go thirty days as standard or less. So you think about it, that's smoking fast in comparison. Yeah, well, I would give you an average. You agree to buy a house today. Today's the fifteenth uh, of April. You could be looking at three months, yeah, before you get keys, and that's with no legal hiccups. Yeah, that's and that's that's a long time to have to wait for you yeah. just agreed to buy a house. Um, that's for the second hand market. If it's a, if you're buying a new property, well, obviously that could even take longer depending on how long it takes to be built. Is there a lot of? Is there a pretty robust new housing market or new construction there? <laughs> There is, and it's certainly been grown. There's a scheme, the government, a government scheme um, for the help to buy scheme, which is a where the government will actually give five percent of the cost price up to twenty thousand towards it. But it really wouldn't be of any value to someone coming into the country because it's based on the amount of tax you paid in the country in the last four years. Okay. So any people coming into the country, the advice would be, unless you really want a new house would be to look at a second-hand property because there's an argument to be made that this help-to-buy scheme is already priced into the market. Yeah. As in, it's, it just helps people with the deposit. Um, so that, that kind of, I would be recommending people who are looking, who are coming in and don't really qualify for it, that second-hand is where you're going to get a better, a better um, value for your book, you know. Interesting. And when people... Um, get a mortgage. I know it's going to be a range, but like, what are interest rates like? Um, let's say today versus traditional. What kind of interest rate or what is? Well, the interest rates are, like? are are low, um, but they're not as low as Europe. The rates would be in the region of about, but somewhere between two point three to three and a half um, would be the range, depending on again our our offer rates are, could be slightly different to America as well. You, we could take a variable rate. Or you can take fixed rates, but the fixed rates can only be for up to a maximum of seven years. Maybe one bank might offer a ten year. So the most of the rates are range between three to five to seven year fixed are a variable rate. Again, they are um, the rates lowest rate would be are two and a half, two point three, yeah. up to three and a half, four. But they are um, they're higher than in Europe and probably higher than the US as well, based on as what I mentioned earlier on, that you're based on the fact that there's a risk. Well, A, we're going back to the, the financial crisis. The banks got themselves into trouble here and they're kind of still paying that back in effect. Mm. But more to do with, it's very difficult for a bank to get their house back if yeah. there's a problem. Yeah. So there's a risk premium attached to, because Ireland as a society doesn't want to be taking homes off people. So because of that, it, there is the higher, there's a slightly higher rate for, um, the bank's charge to factor yeah. that greater risk in. So when you talk about variable and fixed loans, which we have, we call them variable or adjustable, and, and maybe for they're fixed for three years or five years or seven years or 10 years, and then they might even be interest only, but then they go fully amortized. But, but most of these loans are amortized over 30 years. That's what's pretty standard. 
where whether it's fixed rate for 30 years or whether it's fixed for a certain period and then it goes variable, but it's spread out over 30 years. Do you guys have that kind of amortization? Yeah, the term would be over whatever, depending on whatever age you are. Um, you might be able to borrow up to the age of 66, 68, or in some instances, 70. So that your age and your occupation would determine the, the maximum term that you could go to. The, the rates, in, if you're buying a home, interest only is not available, right? Mm -hmm. It was in the past, but when the um, back in financial 12 years ago, that was taken off the table and has yeah. never come back. And rightly so with regard to buying a home in my view. Um, so it's on an annuity or amortized basis from the get go. Your choice or the, the choice of the customer really would be to decide, well, how do they view the market, the interest rate market? Do they think it'll go up? Do they think it'll go down? Do they want the flexibility to be able to overpay their mortgage or do they want the security of knowing that for the next three years, no matter what happens in the world, no matter what happens to interest rates, that um, that they're safe. So yeah. it, it, that, that's there's no, again, that conversation I will always have with customers, but again, there's no crystal ball here. It's a case of what, like hindsight is great. You can always look back, I should have done this, but that's not, um, that's not really possible, well, obviously. So it's a case of what, based on all the available information at any given point, what suits your own, feelings yeah. and thoughts at that point that's too. interesting how about um how about paying off the home do a lot of people manage to through their lifetime pay off the home and maybe leave it to their heirs well yeah well the, obviously the um the, the advice i would always give the quicker you can pay your mortgage back the less interest you've paid in, in total in total um there are people who would at certain points would refinance down the road and they would reduce the term if their salaries have gone up and they can afford to they can afford to pay more um or if they've taken a variable rate and their lump sum comes in they can make lump sum payments off the mortgage so that, again reducing the, the term so yes in the ideal world you will ultimately have it paid off when you need you the maximum you can go to 68 in some cases 70 anyway so at that point the loan is death it's it, the house is debt free basically Huh. Okay, great. Yeah, I know in the US, that's the, you know, home ownership is the standard. But back in the day, the formula was basically get a good job, buy a home, pay it off over 30 years, you're at the same company forever, and you have your home paid off in retirement. Unfortunately, that's, that's totally fallen apart over the last 30 years or so. Um, in Ireland, would you say owning a home is less expensive than renting? Well, currently, right, it is. The rental market here, now unless this changes based on current situation, but it's, it's, it can be more expensive to rent than pay your mortgage, yeah. which is um, it's kind of shocking. I have um, customers paying over 2,500 euro per month in rent. I, this is euros now, um, where their mortgage may only be 1,800. So like it's, it, it, the concept of owning your own home, or it, it makes sense when you view just on a, on a rental basis. But obviously that's only one factor in it, you know. And I think it's about $1.10 is one euro. So it's not that far off. Your prices are, or your currency is almost equivalent. So 2,500 uh, euros is about 2,700 US dollars. So yeah, that's a... That's a pretty high price tag. What are what yeah. are the uh, property prices like there? I know they're probably higher in the city where you're at. Yeah, Dublin will be the most expensive. Um, the prices in the last twelve months have pretty much stabilized. They hadn't. They weren't. They were kind of, and um, they hadn't really gone up, or they hadn't really gone down. They're kind of fluctuating in and around. Um, obviously, there might be an adjustment now, um, but really, you're looking at. Like Dublin would be the most expensive part of the country. Then you'd have Cork, then you'd have Galway, and then you'd probably have Limerick as the cities. And then out on the outskirts of Dublin would also be pretty would be pretty ex expensive. Um, as I said earlier on, it's the biggest issue in the country was yeah. the price of properties. People know, there's obviously a significant number of people who are homeless, but then there's also a significant number of people who want to get on the housing ladder and at the moment are priced out of it. Now, in theory, once this um, uh, epidemic or a pandemic has been sorted when and the government here has formed 
their number one priority will be to try to help people get on the housing ladder. Um, so he was hoping that, that they managed to help more and more people. Wow, so there's, a, the demand, there's a, like the a housing crisis, there. huh? So that's really... Sorry? So there's a bit of a housing crisis or something where you, you just don't yeah, have enough... Yeah, absolutely. It would be called a housing crisis. I'm probably more... A crisis would be their own choice of words. I'd go with a housing shortage okay. um, where there's not enough people, there's not enough houses to supply the demand that was out there. And that demand isn't going anywhere. It just might be slightly reduced, but it's still really, really significant. So the biggest problem here at the moment in the housing market um, is the supply. Mm. Um, the supply wasn't at the point where it was. So that's what was creating the... Because the banks, in fairness, have been lending very, very... Um, well, they've taken due care. The, getting a loan now is a much more difficult yeah. process. They yeah. almost want to know what you're having for breakfast, the level of detail that they look at. It's very, very forensic. Um, if someone's gambling online, they'd say no. So, like, there's a whole wow. heap of stuff that... Yeah, yeah, no, no. There's a whole heap of things. So, going back to the point, the, the crucial point is how difficult it is for a bank to get the house back now that they are so forensic in the level of information they look at. You Firstly, you need to prove to the you need to prove to the bank that you can meet the repayments. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if your if your repayments are going to be eighteen hundred, for example, per month, you would need to be either paying rent of eighteen hundred per month, or if you're paying rent of thousand, you need to be saving another eight hundred per month, and they'd need to see that on a consistent basis over six months. That's the first kind of tick box to make sure that you can prove to the bank that you can actually meet your repayments. Yeah. Um, so wow, then pretty... they look at all sorts of transactions. If they don't like money coming in and coming out, if there's a lot of strange things going on with a bank account, they could use that as a reason to say no. This is a little bit off the uh, off the the linear line of 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 the conversation. But you were saying how would they... any other way, Norm? Yeah, I know, I know. When our minds start working, when they start churning <laughs> over time. But you mentioned that they check uh, if you're doing some sort of gambling as a risk factor they're gauging risk which i totally understand do they check do they actually start googling people and looking at social media um i wouldn't be surprised but i haven't actually heard that yet um but it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me um if that was the case um but i haven't heard it yeah for sure uh, i I, um, I don't think they're checking people's facebook pages to see what um, Saturday night parties or stuff like that. You laugh, but that <laughs> happens in the U.S. I mean, not necessarily, not necessarily for applying for a home loan. And it's like I didn't like your photo on Facebook, but it's all algorithms these days in the U.S. When you're talking about such a large pool of people, and for credit scoring, um, there's been talk about like, you know, what what kind of loans you take out, where you shop, where you spend your money, you know, uh, even what you like on social media. It's, it's, it's all encroaching and sort of starting to God, factor scary. in. Yeah, it's very scary. So I just, I was just wondering that. How about the uh, investment market? Are there a lot of investors, like just people who buy three, four houses and rent them out? Yeah, that would, would certainly, well, that was big back in 12 years ago, or that was probably one of the reasons that, in Ireland, where the, the, the crash came up and people who had, were over leveraged in, in their borrowings, and um, it's the banks like the, the mortgage market had kind of only really reformed itself properly three to four years ago. Up until then, it was still finding its feet uh, after the, the crash, right? And it was only kind of for, so it was only, only really reopening back up. And it's been more slow into in getting into the investment market. Not all the banks are very keen on that type of lending, right? So it's a much mm. um, diff, more diff, different beast, basically, in effect, and not as easy. They require 30% down rather than the 10% down. They require, they'll be higher um, rate. They need proof that the rent rental yield is going to be there in the location. Um, so it's it's a totally different um, field that yeah. would be... Interesting. Nice Interesting. Know? Yeah. And we talked a little about um, where you see the the mortgage market and real estate market uh, going in Ireland. And again, no one has a crystal ball. We're all just completely uh, just guessing really at this point. But where, where do you see Ireland's economy going in the next year, two, five years? 
Well, taking us the, the short term to start with, um, on, on the housing market per se, as I said, I do think there'll be a small um, adjustment, but I don't see any crash. The demand is is still really, really strong, and obviously the housing market is a, a pretty um, strong indicator as to what's going to happen. So that if that if that maintains a sort of a, an equilibrium of sorts, the confidence will come back into the market. There are going to be portion of people who will be seriously affected as to by what's gone yeah, on. Yeah. Um, but the Irish economy was in a very strong place before um, the, the outbreak. So I would see it coming back. It might take a little bit of time. There's still some really big companies here and some American companies that I mentioned earlier on that are, well, they're only growing. And are, they seem to view Ireland as a very strong base, mm. I suppose, based on how close we are to Europe, based on the English language. So I can only see that growing and I can only see um, the actual economy. But it's going to take a hit. It, it can't not take a hit. Well, everyone is. Yeah. But, but yeah. But I don't I don't see it going into a, a tailspin. Yeah. Um, that would be my view. And as I said, I well, don't in fact, you know, ball. it becomes just what you spoke to. It becomes more attractive to businesses who are looking to go to leave uh, Silicon Valley in California because it's so expensive or to go offshore with their, some of their operations or manufacturing or call centers, you know, like I live in the Philippines most of the country, most of the year, as you know, That's right. and yeah. they're, even though they're getting hammered with this, like everyone is economically, they're going to bounce back quickly because there's going to be 20% of us companies say, we need to reduce our, our overhead and our costs. Let's move whatever we can overseas. And so, uh, you know, there's some, some value there. So yeah, I think, in, in yeah. all situations, and this is going to sound terrible, but there's always winners and losers. And obviously this is a terrible situation, but there will be people who will be able to benefit from what's happening. If the, even if the market was to come from, I keep talking with, with regard to housing here, um, even if the prices were to come down, there's going to be a position for people who will be able to take advantage of that. And we'll only be too willing to take advantage of that, you know. Interesting. Yeah, there's always, you know, there's always opportunities. I, I told someone, a client the other day that no matter what crisis or economic downturn, there's always an equal number of opportunities for people who are ready to scoop them up. Um, and it sounds like first time buyers and people who are looking to get in the home market are going to benefit. Um, yeah, and that, that's the point I've been getting to people as in, A, get yourself approved before the bank do change their criteria and then be waiting for the right opportunity to come along if something moves in your favor. Yeah, and I, I do see, like we talked about, I mean, you guys have 10% of foreigners in the country. That's that's huge. But I do see more and more people looking to either retire through all this, the cost of living is too high in the US, or they go for jobs. So. Do you see more and more expats or foreigners moving to Ireland over the next few years? Interesting question. Like Dublin um, isn't the cheapest city. I do have people, but from a rental point of view, it can be quite, viewed as expensive. But outside of Dublin, where there's so much space and it's beautiful countryside and the people were looking for that type of life, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it would be a great place to live on, on, a, on a relatively cheap places now would it be as cheap as some other places to live in the world probably not but it would have a lot of other things going for it um that other countries wouldn't have but outside of dublin you could come and live in here in ireland um on a really really economical basis and have, and yeah. have a great life to boot it sounds amazing shoot i want to move over <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have to get you over here someday. yeah hey um so I have obviously a, a big network, a lot of people listening here of realtors, uh, lenders, people in the U.S. in that capacity, financial planners, CPAs, all that fun stuff. If there's someone who's interested in moving to Ireland to get some more, um, get some more advice or interested in buying a house there, or maybe a realtor wants to refer you clients and set up some sort of you know, legit arrangement um, with referrals, how could they get in touch with you? Well, I suppose the um, best way would be by email. Um, my email address would be johnc at moneysafe.ie. Um, uh, yeah, and then we could set up a phone call at, at that point. I would get the odd person coming to me who's looking to go to the States, believe it or not. But uh, it wouldn't be that many, but the odd time that does come. So um, I'd be more than happy to um, reciprocate any um, introductions. Yeah, why not, right? I mean, it's it's every deal helps everyone, so... 
Yeah, that's great. So people could email you. And then I wanted to, uh, I've taken up a lot of your time and this has been awesome. I really appreciate it. But I wanted to <laughs> end with uh, three fun questions, which I, I always end the podcast to, right? So get, get ready. Get the drums rolling here, Norm. Just yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it true that most people in Ireland drink Guinness? Ooh, um, which means I never drank Guinness. Really? Um, but I, yeah, I would probably be the only Irishman that has never drank Guinness. Um, but yes, it, uh, my best friend of 30 years, literally three weeks ago, I don't know what there's all going on in the world, decided he liked Guinness and he hadn't liked it for years. So, um, yeah, I, it's a, it's certainly the, um, well, it's the cliche. You think of Ireland, you think of a pint of Guinness, basically. So yes, it would be there would be a significant percentage of Irish. People but I mean, is Guinness. it is it popular over there, or pe- do people drink like Budweiser or something? Like what's popular? Yeah, yeah. No, it depends on the sort of age profile and the people you're and the, like. I would imagine, sorry, the, the people in their twenties, late twenties, early thirties. I wouldn't imagine to be that many of them would be Guinness drinkers. It's yeah. kind of probably anyone from 40 mm. upwards would be where you'd have a higher percentage. It's and, old school. Hmm. Yeah, okay. That so would be my thinking. since we're, so, we're doing ridiculous stereotypes because I'm so uninformed, <laughs> what is one thing that people don't know about Ireland or they might be shocked about normal life there? Ooh, man, that's a really good question. I'm trying to think what would they, what do, uh, we don't all drink Guinness. But yeah, that's that. one thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, probably the, a lot of this is, again, I don't want to be too political here, but a lot of um, people, this wouldn't just be Americans, but a lot of people outside of Europe actually think Ireland is part of Great Britain. Yeah. Um, and that is, sorry, don't even get into any political. No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> but, but it is something that people would certainly, oh, you know, but I, and yes, because North, North of Ireland does belong to Great Britain, but the Republic of Ireland doesn't. And that, that would be something that would be, uh, that we would be at um, pains to, <laughs> to emphasize. People yeah. don't realize how crazy and bloody and how long that, that war, right? The, uh, between trying to get repatriation for, for Northern Ireland, right? I mean, that was some nasty stuff. Yeah, no, and I'll give you a claim to fame story. There's um, Eamon de Valera, who was one of the founding fathers of, of Ireland, right, um, was involved in the, the 1916 rebellion. Now, he asked my great-grandmother to marry him, but really? she turned him down. Yeah. Now, he w- he w- all the leaders of that rebellion in 1916 were all executed by the Great British, apart from Eamon de Valera, and the reason being he had an American passport. Ah, look at that. <laughs> so there you go. But he asked my great grandmother to marry him and she turned him down for for what thankfully, otherwise I wouldn't be here, Norm. But, yeah. uh, but there's a there's a fun fact for you. So you have quite uh-huh. a quite a lineage. What? So that's uh, my instinct to call you sir was probably spot on, huh? <laughs> the superstar, yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me, so what's the final or was that the final fun question? We got one more, and this one is very okay. serious. This one is Put a lot of thought. This is a really, really uh, good question that's very serious. So dig deep on this one. You ready? Okay. I'm ready. Conor McGregor versus Rocky in a fight. Who wins? Ooh, interesting. I, again, will be one of the archers. Don't have any time for Conor McGregor, by the way. <laughs> so um, I would be hoping, I'd be shouting for Rocky every day of the week. <laughs> Not sure who'd win, though. But, um... Rocky will be getting my support. <laughs> nice, man. Well, John Coleman, thank you so much. We had a blast, and I'm going to encourage everyone to get in touch with you. Norm, as, as always, a pleasure talking to you, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll hook up again soon. And we'll get you to Ireland someday, and we'll let you taste the pint of Guinness, and you can, be, you can make your own judgment on it. <laughs> you got it. Cheers, mate. Take care. <laughs> Cheers, Norm. All the best.